Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Perry Marino. I'm a reference instruction librarian here at the University of Idaho. Um, and so today's workshop is on uh, creating research posters and specifically research posters in PowerPoint. So I'm just going to share my screen. So um, for today's workshop, I'm just going to go over a couple of things. We're going to start with um, the poster guide that we've created um, to go along with this workshop and to be used independently. Um, go over some research poster basics, um, some do's and don'ts, um, and then tips and tricks specifically in PowerPoint. And then with everything online and virtual at the moment, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about virtual presentations and then get more into accessibility, um, both for in-person posters and for virtual posters. So just gonna start off by the poster guide, just if you wouldn't, that link should end up in the chat. Yes, uh, one moment. <laughs> um, and so that guide, if you click that link, it'll take you to this guide and it's broken up into a couple of sections. Um, the first, uh, on the home page, there's a little bit of info about the two big research um, internal U of I for research poster ex exhibits for students. Um, there's the undergraduate research symposium and the student research expo. Um, the first tab of that is creating your poster. And this is, this has just the very basics of PowerPoint. So like sizing it and that kind of thing. I'll get a little bit more in depth during the presentation, but if you, but this is the essential need to know kind of things. Um, and then the next tab is designing your poster. And so this has a little bit about um, the sections of a poster you can include um, and a little bit about what each of those involves. Um, and then the next one is image and visual resources. So a big thing about posters is visualizations and images and graphics to catch your attention. Um, and so this tab has um, different places where you can create those graphics. And then it also link, there's also a link to the, our image resources guide um, which is a guide that's dedicated just to the images that um, the databases images that we have here at the University of Idaho Library and um, resources that are in our special collections and things like that. It also talks a little bit about copyright information and citing images and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then the next tab is presentations and handouts. So this part um, applies more to in-person research poster conferences, um, but there are still things that you can adapt for a virtual conference. Um, and then there's our last tab, which is printing your poster, um, which may or may not apply in this climate um, of pandemic. Um, and so this, this tab is all about how to get your print, poster printed using at the University of Idaho Copy and Print Center. So it's got information on what sizes you need to make it and then uh, getting it mounted if you want that to happen um, and cost and pricing and that kind of thing. So, um, so I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So we're just gonna start off and we're just gonna look at a couple of research posters. And um, if you take a look at it and think about what catches your eye, um, where, what's something you might've done differently, um, how you think it might be improved and feel free to put those answers in the chat or unmute yourself and answer. I realize I have lost my chat window. Um, uh, someone has said that there's a lot of text, perhaps too much. Yes, um, and that's something that uh, we'll talk a little bit about in the do's and don'ts. But yeah, text and blocks of text is something to keep in mind. Does anybody have any, ha any other comments about this poster? I'm going to add that I don't think it's very visually interesting. Yes. Um, 
Okay, so if that's all we have for this poster, we'll look at the second poster. Oh, we had another comment oh. that the title doesn't stand out. Okay, yeah, it kind of blends in um, and it's off to the right hand corner. How about the second poster? Is there anything that catches your eye or you might've done differently? This is Barbara. I think it's actually a pretty good poster. I like the black text on the white background and then the use of some color within. We have a comment in the chat that there's, there's too much text. Yeah, so this one is the same thing. You've got blocks of text, um, but yeah, the color in this case, there's uh, not too much to overwhelm and what color there is catches your eye. Um, so those are, so this posters can look like all sorts of things. Um, you can get as creative or not as creative as you want. Um, and, and because they're your own research posters, you can customize them however you feel like. Um, but there are some poster basics that you should keep in mind when you're doing, creating your research poster. And the first is the setup. Um, when you set your poster up, um, and I'm going to actually create a new PowerPoint and we'll mess with that PowerPoint. And so file, new, and it's just a blank PowerPoint. Um, let's see, I'm gonna switch over to that new PowerPoint. Okay, is everybody seeing the new blank PowerPoint? Yes, Okay, you're seeing it. Um, so this is just your basic PowerPoint first title slide template, um, but this is, it's currently sized for a PowerPoint presentation and it's not sized for a research poster. So um, one of the first things you should do is resize your poster because if you don't resize your poster first, everything that comes after, you'll have to go back and adjust them for the new size. And you can resize it in the design tab of PowerPoint and then here in slide size on the far right. And then it has two standard sizes that are for PowerPoints, but what we're going to actually do is the custom slide size. Um, so in this this is where we'll choose both the orientation and the size of the slide. Uh, standard poster size is, is 36 inches high by 48 inches wide. Um, so that's 36 by 48. But if you're getting this uh, printed at the copy and print center, you need to allow for some allowance, um, some margins in there. Otherwise you'll have to pay extra because when they print, they need some margins to in there. Um, so the print center's current margins, they want you to set it at 35.4 by 47.2. And it's really similar. What will just happen is when it's printed, um, there will be a thin white border around the whole thing. And if your background's white, you won't even be able to tell. Um, and you can also choose your orientation here. I prefer landscape. Um, I have seen portrait um, posters. Um, when they're in, in person, I'm not a huge fan because depending on how high they're hung, sometimes you have to bend down to see the bottom information, whereas portrait tends to land more at eye le level, or sorry, where landscape lands more at eye level, portrait, sometimes you'll have to bend down. So if you just hit OK, it, what this screen here is, it's going to, it's all about resizing what's currently on there. And we're not, I'm not really worried about that because it's just the default title. So you can choose whichever one you want um, and it will resize things. Um, and so the other thing to keep in mind is what you need to include. So different poster conferences will sometimes require you to include certain things. So for that first poster we looked at, um, the one with the red and the white and or red and the yellow and blue blocks, that had actually had a requirement, a uh, couple of templates to choose from. And the reason why the title was in the far right was because they required that title to be in the far right. Um, so sometimes you have to accommodate what the conference is requiring posters to look like. But in most cases, a couple of things that tend to be pretty standard are a title. Um, so we'll just do, just, just borrow this text box and make that the title. 
and we'll just move that here to the top. Um, and then another thing that's standard is the author or authors. So just put my name on there and stick that over here. Um, but other things that are common are abstracts, uh, methods, um, charts and graphs are pretty much standard. They're important to catching people's eyes and then conclusions. Um, anything else, um, give and take depending on your own research and what you're trying to present and then the requirements of, of the conference or the presentation. Um, and so what I like to do is when I start laying out a poster is I tend to take uh, boxes. So I'll just use the shapes option here in PowerPoint and just put boxes around. So maybe I'll put the abstract there. Um, and I know I'm going to need a uh, method section. So this will be the method section. Um, just make that a different color. And I'm going to know I'm going to have a couple of charts or graphs. So I'll put those here. Um, and then I'll need a conclusion. And so I'll put that over here. And I can always go and move things around if I don't like where it is, but this just gives me a rough estimate of how much size I have to use. Um, and so it can help me keep in mind like how much space I have and where things go. So looking at this, I have some extra space up here. So maybe I want to make this box shorter and put maybe an introduction box there or something like that. Um, just resize things, things like that. And then with these boxes, uh, you can technically, you can write in these boxes, so you can add text. Um, but I found that the when you add text into a box, it makes it, it's not as easy to manipulate as it should be. Like you can still resize it and things like that, but it's easier to mess around with the text box. And you can add text box by go to insert and then text box, and then just overlay the text box on the block you're looking at and then type in the text box and then res resize the text box as needed. Oop, not. And so that's one way to add your text. And then if I wanna delete the boxes, cause I realize that the text that I'm doing is gonna take up more space. I can adjust the text boxes and once I'm done, I can delete the shapes in the background. And so I'll have things laid out and I know how much space is in between um, the boxes. So another thing you need to keep in mind is the size of the text. So when you're looking, if you noticed when I insert started typing, the text was really, really tiny. And so that's because the, even though the poster looks the same size as it would be if you were creating a PowerPoint presentation, it's actually scaled down to fit the screen. Um, and so it's using that, the, I think it was 11 point default text for Calibri. And so you have to make it bigger to make it actually legible in a poster. And typically font sizes um, have ranges and it all depends on how much space you need. So the title of a poster tends to be between 72 and 120 point font. So this is actually ginormous. Um, just make it bigger and then I can move things around and that gives me more space to work with also. And then uh, for section headers, those tend to go from a range of 36 to 72 point fonts and then body text 24 to 48. And you can always resize those texts, the text. So if you are running out of space, you can make the text a little bit smaller. So, uh, so it's um, easier to read or so you can get more information in there. So I'm gonna go back to our um, presentation. So that's just poster basics. Does anybody have any questions about the very basics of a research poster? I don't see, there's nothing in the chat. Okay. So we'll move on to some do's and don'ts. Um, so big do's is you want to make it appealing to the eye. Um, and that can happen in a couple of ways. Um, so one of those things is more visuals and less text. 
So in an in-person poster presentation, people decide to stop at your poster because they see, see the title and then what they're seeing at a glance looks appealing. And so something that catches people eyes, people's eyes are visuals. So whether it's charts or graphs or just images or photos, um, those things catch people's attention, whereas text wouldn't. Um, so you should think of text as something to draw the eye and, or sorry, images to draw the eye and then text to supplement those. Um, another thing to keep in, to make it appealing to the eye is white space. So somewhere to rest your eyes. Um, so that first poster we looked at was really busy. There wasn't a lot of negative space. Um, it, was, it seemed to nonstop, look here, look here, look here. Whereas white space will allow you to pause and your eyes to rest for a little bit. Um, and then another do is to emphasize things. So you can emphasize things like by bolding them or italicizing them or making the font or making the text a little bit bigger. Um, and so you want to make sure you're emphasizing sparingly because if your whole, if everything's in bold, nothing's actually emphasized. Um, so you should keep that in mind. So good things to bold are headings and titles and uh, maybe a key sentence um, in the conclusion or something like that. So if you only have a one sentence takeaway, maybe it's this sentence. Um, you can also use itali italics or underlines to emphasize, te emphasize things. Um, color is also a good way to draw attention to things. Um, so if your whole poster is black and white, but your chart is in color, in addition to being a chart and or a graph and eye catching in itself, the color is an extra layer to bring attention to it. Um, and then lists. So as, as it was mentioned for both posters, there were blocks of text. And that's just, it takes a while to read blocks of text and it's not as appealing to look at. So when you can, bulleted lists are great. Um, so if there's a, you're listing steps or you're listing um, people involved, some bulleted list makes things easier to read and it also draws attention to those things, whereas a block, block of tech, text wouldn't. Um, and then images. So there are a couple things to keep, keep into account for images. The first one is making sure the images you use are, you're not breaking copyright. Um, so if you're using your own images, you'll be fine. But if you're using images from the internet, um, there, you need to keep in mind copyright restrictions or use, usage restrictions. Um, and so that image guide that was linked from the poster guide has information about copyright and uh, Creative Commons licensing. And so that's a good thing to reference. It also has lists of databases that the University of Idaho subscribes to and those allow you to have different usage rights. Um, but if you're not, if you're not finding what you need in any of those, there's also Google image. You can just do a Google image search. So let's, so when you do a search in Google images, um, it pulls up, it's basically going through the internet and finding it. But a lot of these have copyright restrictions or usage restrictions that you don't want to, not so good to violate. But Google has a um, helpful tool to look into that. So this tool section here, um, this, and then there's the usage rights options. And then you can do Creative Commons licensing. And so these are all images that are under Creative Commons, which allow you to use them um, most, with different at attributions. Um, and you can, again, use that image resources guide to look at what the definitions of the different Creative Commons are. But so um, you look at this, it's the image, and then if you click on the image, it'll take you to the source and it'll pro provide you with a little bit of information about it. So you can use that information to both cite it and to figure out what the usage rights are. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you want to select images that are large. Um, so if you start with a small image, when it's printed, the image gets, ex gets enlarged. And if you, the image itself, original image is pretty small, it can get really pixelated when it's enlarged. So you want to find images that are large to begin with. Um, and 
actually the best kind of images are the images that are so large that you have to make them smaller because um, you don't lose anything in, in that. And you, Google also has a size option. So choose the, if you choose the large, these are all the largest images. So now this search is for images with Creative Commons licensing and that are extra, that are, are large. And so these are images that'll hold up better when they are um, enlarged when the poster is printed. Um, and, and so that the size and then resolution of the graphics make a difference when things are enlarged. Um, in general, J JPEG images or J JPG or images are picture images and then PNG images tend to do better with text. Um, and um, if, so if you have an image or a diagram that has a lot of text on it, a JP, PNG image is probably your better option. And those tend to hold up better when they're expanded, um, but they are also uh, larger file sizes. So that's something to keep in mind. So, all right, so now we're gonna get back into PowerPoint. A um, Couple things in PowerPoint. We'll go back to our testing slide or testing PowerPoint. So the design tab, so if you go over here in the top, the design tab allows you to change the background format. So right next to where you change the, sides, the slide size is format background. And that opens this bar over here on the right and so typically I recommend a solid fill because they're easy to read and I recommend a light background over a dark background. Um, but you also have the options to gradient fill or picture in the background or pattern. Um, but again, I recommend a lighter background, a lighter solid background. And so the other way you can format your background is you can just right click on the poster and there's the format ba background option. Um, uh, other thing is smart art. So if you may or may not be familiar with smart art, but smart art is a good thing to include. Um, like uh, bulleted lists, it, smart art is a good way to draw attention to things without uh, in a way that isn't a block of text. So there are a bunch of different options. There are lists and processes and pyramids. Um, processes tends to be a good one. So if you are talking through the steps of your experiment um, and you wanna share that with everybody, you can just type in, so start, middle, and, and you can change that color if you want um, to match whatever you're looking for and then you resize that. And so that's one way to display something that isn't text. Um, and if it's not suitable for um, say a, a graph. Um, but they're all different types of smart art you can use and sometimes you can play around with them and find out which one fits, fits best with both your poster and what you're trying to display. Um, and the interesting thing about smart art is you can also save them as pictures. So if you right click on it, um, there's a, there should be, there it is, save as picture. And this, and so you can save it as a picture to use in other things also. So in, on, um, say in a Word document or somewhere else. And that's just a good way to use that same smart art in other locations. And then, so charts and graphs, I've been mentioning those. Um, actually, we'll keep that around. Um, so in the same insert tab, there's charts. And so charts are, um, there are a couple things about charts is that there's the options that are, are options mirror the options in Excel. Um, so you select your chart and hit OK, and it will automatically put in a chart. And what it also do is it'll have a little window that kind of looks like Excel. And what you can do is you can manually enter um, the data and change the, change the title or change the different categories and change that data that way. Um, and so that's all internal to Mac, 
um, to PowerPoint. And that's a good choice and option if it's just a simple graph. So like a pie graph with only a couple of um, values in it. But in some of your research, you can get really complicated. And so some, have some really elaborate graphs. And if that's the case, there's a way to actually import graphs from Excel where you have more capabilities. So um, I'm just gonna go over to a sample Excel, Excel sheet. And so I've just created a, a graph. Um, and so this is the graph I, I've manipulated how I wanted. And what I can do is I can right click and I can just copy it. And then I go back to PowerPoint. And I don't need this one anymore. And then I'll put that here. And so I right click and there are a couple options. So I can paste it as a picture. So that means this is gonna be a static image. It's not gonna ever change. It'll look exactly like the Excel one. Um, and so that's fine if you're finished or you're afraid that you're gonna mess things up. Um, but there's also a way to make the, uh, your chart dynamic. So if you right click and you paste there, you have um, the option to embedded workbook. So what that does is the embedded workbook option is just taking all that information that's in Excel and it's importing it into PowerPoint. Um, and so with the embedded workbook, when you, in, with, with the non-picture charts, you'll have to adjust the size of the text to make it legible. Um, but with the embedded workbook, say a last minute thing came up and I got one more response to my survey or something, I can go into the chart and design and then I can edit my data. So I can edit data and it will open up that workbook and I can change it here. So maybe turns out eight dogs like bananas. And so then it'll change that chart to match. Um, and so that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is through linked data. So if you right click and you paste, um, paste with link, linked data. And what that's doing is it keeping all that information over in Excel, which is great if it's a really complicated chart um, and really complicated data sets. Um, and it, whenever that Excel sheet it's coming from is updated, it will up update the chart here in PowerPoint. So I'm just gonna go over to that Excel sheet. Um, not gonna make you share this. So, and so I made that change. And so now that change is reflected here in that PowerPoint. So you can make whatever changes you want in your Excel sheet and it will mirror it here in the PowerPoint. Um, so one thing to keep in mind though is for with the linked uh, linked data is that do not move that Excel sheet. Do not save it in a new place, um, move it to a different folder because then you'll get an error and you'll just have to restart the process. Um, so make sure that it's saved where it's going to be saved permanently if, you, if you're using the linked data option. Um, another thing I'm going to show you is about aligning objects. So it looks like my PowerPoint's a little off center. Um, the view option can help me with that. So I currently have the ruler on view. So this zero is the center of the PowerPoint. Um, and I can also use the guidelines, which break it into quadrants um, and that cross. So this is the exact center of the poster. And then there's also the guidelines and that breaks it into little squares. Um, none of these will get printed on your final poster. It's just there for um, guidance when you move things around. Um, but there's also the option to arrange, so home, arrange, and align, let's see, range, align, and then align to center. So that, so now this chart is aligned in the exact center of the, of the PowerPoint slide. Um, you can also arrange, align, uh, bottom, so now it's at the very bottom of this slide. And that's one way of doing it, moving things around. Another way is um, in the format shape. So let me close this because that's left over. If you right click on the shape and then um, size and position, 
will open up this box over here on the right. And that lets you manipulate the shape or the text box or the chart. Um, you can, the shape option, you can change the color and add some emphasize with shadows and stuff if you want. But there's also the size and proportion position option. So size, maybe I know that I need a, my abstract needs to be, I don't know, six by six for some reason. That's required by the conference. It's a six by six abstract. So I can change that and it will resize that to six by six inches by six inches. Um, and so that's something you can take into account. But also maybe I wanna make sure that I only have a one inch border around it. So this around my poster. So maybe I, so that's the size. And so the position over here, you have two options. You can align from the left corner or align from center. So it's aligned for the, let's align from the top left corner. And so I want only an inch around it. So from the horizontal position, I just want one inch. And so that'll move it up. So there's only gonna be one inch between the edge of my poster and this, this box. Um, so that's a way to move it around and make sure things are uniform. So then I can move this and make sure that this one lines up. So one inch. Um, so now those are, I know that those are going to be exactly aligned when this, it's printed out. Um, and I can always go back and double, I like to do, go back at the very end and make sure things are lined up. So as I'm making my poster, maybe I move things around to make, to fit things better. And it's easier just to move my, move it with my mouse. Um, I can go back at the end and just make sure that they're going to be lined up in exactly the same place. Um. Anybody have any questions about that? There's nothing in the chat box now. We can just wait one more second to see if anybody puts something in there. All right. So if there's nothing in the chat, we're going to move on to vir virtu virtual presentations. Um, so the thing about virtual presentations is there is a bunch of different ways to do them. Um, so there are a bunch of different formats that formats and there are some best practices that are specific to different formats of presentations. So the first, so if you, different formats that you can come across for virtual presentations are both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, asynchronous tends to be the most common. Um, it's harder to arrange a, um, a synchronous power, uh, poster presentation. Um, so we'll first talk about um, the asynchronous ones. And there are a couple different options for asynchronous. There is asynchronous video presentations. So what that can involve is either a, um, you up, you share your poster with people um, through whatever platform the conference wants you to. And then you, you, there's a video to go along with that. And so that um, is a video in a poster separate. And so what you'll do is you'll upload both and your video is talking about your poster, what you found, um, that kind of thing. And then the other option, and so that can be, that's, that'll be pre-recorded. And the other pre-recorded option is if it's a, um, the poster and video in one. And so what, what that look tends to look like is you'll have your poster up on your screen and then you'll be, um, you'll be a little box in the corner talking about your poster, or you'll just be a voice in the background talking about your poster. And that's your video and poster in one. Um, and there are a couple of ways you can do that second option is Zoom has a record option um, that will allow you to record your screen. And then uh, Screencast-O-Matic is another one that's a free source where you can record your screen and using your webcam at the same time. So that one's a good one if you are, um, you want to have your poster up on the screen and then yourself in a little box in the corner talking about it. There is also an asynchronous option where it's a text Q&A. So for that one, what happens is you'll upload, you upload your full poster to a platform and then you're asked to be answer questions over a span of time. So uh, 
you'll upload it and then uh, participants in the conference can go through and look at everything. And then there's a uh, comment box where people can ask questions. And then throughout that span of time, so say a week, um, you'll go through those, those questions and you'll answer them and people come back and check those answers. Um, and so then there is asynchronous using a structured online platform. So there are some online platforms out there that are um, all about that have you build your poster from scratch within that platform. Um, so they tend to have a, templates or you need to have be in columns or things like that. Um, and those like iPoster sessions is one of those platforms. Um, and sometimes those allow you to embed videos. Um, a best practice for embedded videos is to make sure that the video is your own. Um, so you don't want to embed a video and then the day before the conference, whoever's video it is, they decide to delete it or they hide it or they make it private. And then suddenly you've got an error message and that's what your, your poster's got a big video error message on it. Um, are there any other formats any of you have come across? They're all, they're coming up with all different ones. I don't see anything in the chat. I had seen, this is less, I guess, of a thing with virtual presentations, although the idea is the same, where you'd see a poster and all you had was like the title and maybe one, like a blurb about it. And then it was just like a big QR code that would take you to like, hmm a website that they had designed that had all the information so you could really get into the nitty gritty. Um, and I guess you could do something similar for a virtual poster presentation is link out to all the like minute details. Yeah. Um, uh, the undergraduate research symposium used um, a platform used, I believe it was a Q&A type of thing. Um, asynchronous Q&A and so they uploaded the posters to the platform and then everybody could look at it and people could leave comments on it that way. Um, and then I forgot to mention the live options. Um, I've only heard of one way attempt to do the posters live and that was uh, people would the, attend a Zoom session and then be put in breakout rooms and each breakout room would have a poster present, presenter and they'd talk about their poster and people would move between rooms. Um, but I've never experienced that one, so I don't know how feasible it, or common it is. Um, so another thing is that when you're uploading virtual pro presentations, um, a lot of times that format is a PDF. So they ask you to upload a PDF, which means that you can, if you include links in your poster, those will be accessible because you can click on links in PDFs. Um, so that's keep in mind sometimes you, so you won't have to have all that information on your poster. So maybe um, if maybe it was a conference you were planning to do in person, you were gonna have a handout with um, more readings or more information. Um, instead of having a handout, you, you have a link to a document that has that information. Um, so that's something you can do if it's a PDF. So that, brings us to our last section, which is, with it, which is accessibility. So accessibility is always a really important uh, thing to consideration to keep in mind um, because it affects a lot of people and you might not know it. Um, so PowerPoint has this helpful tool on the bottom left, which I'm gonna just show you in this one. It's the Accessibility Investigate. If it's not visible on your PowerPoint, you can just right click on the bar and just make sure the accessibility checker is checked off. Um, and that, that'll put that here on the bar. And then, so when you click on that, what it does is it tells you, it, it's an automatic program that goes through and tells you where you can improve your accessibility in your PowerPoint. So if it's, um, if it's just your, if it's your poster and it's just that one slide, it'll talk to you about images and alternative text. So in this case, it looks like I have a couple of errors. Um, so I'm missing some alternative text. Um, so on slide one, I'm missing the alternative text on rectangle one and rectangle five. I don't know why they're numbered that way. Um, but what I, 
but if that's the case, so say it was actually this, it's better to go back to the sample poster for this one because it has charts in it. Um, so look at the accessibility. Um, inspector here. And so I'm missing alternative text. I'm missing it on rectangles, a diagram, and a chart. So these rectangles, I'm missing it. And so when, for alternative text, there are two options. You can mark it as decorative, which, um, which means that a screen reader, when a screen reader is reading this, it'll skip over it. It won't pay attention to it. Um, or you can add a description. Um, so this rectangle, it's not actually anything in it. I'll mark it as as decorative because what's important is the text that's on top of it. Um, but for this diagram, that actually has important information in it. So I'll add, alter add a, a description to that. So that opens up this alternative text box. And what you want to do is you're just going to tell people exactly what's being said in that image or that diagram. So this is going to be, so this is steps of my research. And then, so start, middle, and end. And so what's going to happen is when a screen reader reads that, it's going to tell the person that this, this diagram contains the steps of my research, and those steps are start, middle, and end. And so that's important for screen readers. Um, and then also, you'll want to do the same thing with the graphs that you have. So you'll just say, um, this chart, chart that shows dogs like eight apples to banana and cats like three apples and seven. And so basically in the alternative text, you're just telling them what the image is. Um, and so the screen reader will identify, will share that information with the person using it. Um, so in addition to ex accessibly investigate, which will do that, um, it also gives you some suggestions on fixing things. So in this case, it's hard to read the text because it contrasts to so this diagram. The white is not doesn't provide enough contrast in there. So I can change the color of the text to, to help with that. Um, and it also, um, the reading order might be improved, make sure things are read in order. So I wanna make sure the title's read first and then my name and then the abstract, um, that kind of thing. Um, and so you can also change the alternative text by right clicking on it. Come on, right click. And then edit alt text, and that'll open this box also. So you can do that as you create all the images and charts, and so you don't have to do it all at the end. Um, it's, so then it's gonna take us to, so the next thing is color, new share. Um, so color blindness is another thing to keep in mind, um, and that affects so the, the alternative text is a big thing, especially with the virtual conferences. Um, but colorblindness affects both virtual and in person. And so that's something you need to keep in mind. There's a decent portion of the population that has some form of colorblindness. Um, and so what you can do is you can put your poster in a colorblindness simulator. So um, the, I found the, Co the Cobless colorblindness Blindness, blindness simulator is pretty good. Um, you can find it by Googling Cobliss. I think Jessica is gonna share the link to that in the chat also. Um, but I'll just take you to that. So this is the colorblind, the Cobliss colorblindness simulator. And what you do is you just upload a file. Um, so the only problem is you'll have to save it as a JPG or um, a PNG file because um, it doesn't take PDF files. But once you upload the image, here's what it looks like to somebody without any color blindness. And then you can look at, it will load what it looks like to people with different types of color blindness. And so you can see that, oh, this one doesn't have enough contrast or something like that. And you'll know how you can improve 
and um, prove it for somebody who has color blindness and different types of color blindness. Um, go back to. And so the next thing is fonts um, and fonts are something that will apply to both virtual and in person posters. Um, so when you're choosing your font, you're going to want to choose a sans serif font. Um, so the default for PowerPoint, so Word and Microsoft Office changed their default font a while ago from Times New Roman to um, Calibri. And so clear, Calibri is the default now, and that's a sans serif font. So a serif font is something like, uh, Times New Roman, and serif fonts have these little end caps on them. So the A here, the B here, the I here, and that just makes it harder for, for people with um, dyslexia to read them. Um, and also when the fonts with serifs are expanded, sometimes they can get a little pixelated. So sans serif fonts uh, are better all around for posters, and there are multiple options for those. Um, they are, there are fonts that are specifically made, developed to be made easier to uh, read by people with dyslexia, um, but those you have to specially download and upload to PowerPoint. Um, and so sans serif fonts are just a basic step you can use in that direction. And then there's closed captioning. So this will apply only to virtual ones and virtual ones with a presentation in, involved with it, so a video, video involved. Um, and so closed captionings or um, subtitles to your videos can be really helpful both to um, people who are hard of hearing or deaf and to people who don't have those problems. So if they're doing something else or maybe they're in an open office and they can't um, have their headphones in or they can't listen to it, um, closed captionings allows them to read and figure out what you're saying without having that. And there are a couple ways you can do closed captioning. Is Zoom has a closed captioning option um, you'll have to do a little dig, dig a little deeper in how to do that. There's a couple of steps involved, um, but the Zoom help can get you set up with that. And then YouTube actually has a really great closed captioning option, and it's an automatic closed captioning. And so what you can do is you can, uh, if you're doing a video, you can upload it to YouTube. Um, and if you don't want it shared with the world, you can make it upload your videos private. But you can enable closed captioning on that and it will auto closed caption things and it tends to be pretty good. Sometimes there's some mistakes, but you can go in and edit those mistakes um, and just make it easier. And then if you really want to, they have the option where you can download a trans transcript um, to go along with it. So that's all that I've got. Does anybody have any questions about uh, research posters or Okay, so it looks like um, there's a question. Will Adobe subscription work if you need to save a PowerPoint presentation as a PDF? Yes, so Adobe can do that, but you can also do that directly in PowerPoint. So I'm going to go back into the PowerPoint, and if you do File and then Save As, um, and then if you just choose um, like your browse option. It'll open this window here so you can rename it, choose where you want to save it, and then save as type here. We'll open a drop down of all the different ways that you can save it. And one of them is PDF. Um, and so you can just save it as PDF right there within PowerPoint. And then it'll save wherever you want it to save in your files. And you hit save. And so now, um, now I've got a PDF of my poster. All right, so any more questions about anything? I'm gonna stop recording.